As Todd said, my name is Dave Olson. I'm the director of co-op development at NCG. And uh, really what I'd like to do today is build off a, a conversation that we started last year about some of the trends and consumer trends and, and industry trends that were impacting our co-ops. And I'd like to take that conversation a step further today to talk a little bit about the ways in which co-ops are responding to that uh, and the ways in which co-ops can respond to that. But before I do, I do want to take a little bit of uh, just a moment to talk about the organization that I work for. Um, because uh, I, I always like to take the opportunity to say, from those of you who are from an NCG co-op, uh, we are your co-op. Uh, we are a co-op that's comprised of 150 uh, members, consumer co-ops from across the country. Um, we're represented by a board of directors that's comprised largely of GMs and other co-op leaders um, elected from among the membership. And our, we were created to help co-ops uh, compete uh, to help pool collective buying power, to take it to the marketplace, to get reduced costs of goods and services for co-ops, and to help them uh, compete and improve as retailers and grow. Um, today, we uh, represent about 200 stores in 38 states and uh, serve roughly 1.3, 1.4 million consumer owners, uh, which is a phenomenal thing. Uh, and Within that body of membership, there's a lot of diversity uh, among store types. Uh, we have co-ops that have annual sales of less than one million. Uh, we have co-ops within our group like PCC, uh, it's 250 million in annual sales. Uh, we have co-ops in all kinds of markets, rural, college, town, urban. I think the one thing that everybody is struggling with a little bit today, or the one thing that's a kind of a common denominator besides the business model, is that we're all trying to figure out our place in a in a rapidly changing marketplace. Uh, so last year I came and I talked about what we call the new normal. And in a nutshell, for those of you who weren't here with us last year, the new normal are the trends driven by consumers that are leading to a massive expansion in competitiveness in our industry. Um, but it's important to note that these trends do start with the consumer and they end with the consumer too. Uh, there's more consumers showing interest in natural and organic foods than ever before and more people in the marketplace wanting to take advantage of that. Uh, old, long-term competitors of ours like Whole Foods, as well as a lot of newer uh, competitors. And uh, as a result, the consumer is exposed to a whole lot more variation in terms of retail execution for natural organics. And they, they, they do get exposed. They cross shop more than even the average shopper does. Our co-op shoppers are in three and a half places to get their groceries uh, every single week. And, um, and as a result, they're exposed to different customer service, they're exposed to new prices, they're exposed to different kinds of products. And more than ever, they are really driving the industry in new directions, and the industry is changing. Uh, and as a result of this, um, our source of growth is actually drying up. I don't know if you're able to see these photos very well. These are all photos of, of natural execution. And at one point, we could have looked at these photos and said, these are all examples of food co-ops. But in reality, these are actually all conventional stores. These are all conventional stores that have learned how to compete much better in the natural and organic industry. And that's the crux of our problem, because our historic growth, and for many years, co-ops did benefit from tremendous historic growth. Our historic growth was a result of transition it was a result of regular, everyday, conventional shoppers leaving their Kroger's or their Safeways, uh, leaving their Walmarts, transitioning uh, to places where they could get natural organic products. And for many, many years, that was largely us and some independents and, and, and Whole Foods. But largely, we were the benefit of all this transitioning growth. Today, if we want to bring those customers in, not only do we have to convince them to leave their Safeways and their Kroger's and their Walmarts, which have gotten much better at this game, but we have to convince them to drive past all the Sprouts and the Whole Foods and the natural grocers and the new seasons and the markets of choice out there, and then come and shop with us. And not only that, we have to do such a compelling job in how their customer experience is at our stores that they want to make that same trip again and again. That puts an incredible amount of burden on us in this changing marketplace. Um, the competitive pressures of the new normal have not subsided since last year. They're actually expanding, and we're seeing that manifest 
especially today in this concept of smaller format stores from our competitors. Uh, we saw the first couple 365s open to mixed reviews, I think. Um, but both Kroger and Safeway are also looking at similar approaches because they want to be able to enter markets that they haven't been able to enter into before. Mid-sized communities, more urban markets, places where a smaller footprint store is necessary. And of course, continued interest in delivery service uh, and in uh, online ordering. I just heard on the radio today that um, Blue Apron, which is the sort of meal creation delivery service, is now a billion dollar company. So uh, the competitive pressure continues for all of us. And uh, the pressure is manifests itself in a loss of sales growth. Uh, this is a five year trend for co-op, six year trend for co-ops if you include the projected. Um, and it shows that over time our sales continue to grow but the, the rate of growth is declining uh, relative to the competition entering the industry. And I bring it up because there's a big difference between operating a store that's getting 10% sales growth versus operating a store that's getting three or 4% sales growth. And to put that in perspective, roughly a third of NCG co-ops are actually experiencing negative sales growth today. And a third are in that sort of mid-level, uh, low to no growth environment. Um, it's, it's just harder uh, from the competition. And uh, again, a little bit more perspective. We're actually faring better than a lot of other folks. Independents are not faring this well. And if you factor in the cost of deflation, our sales growth, for same store sales growth, actually is better than Whole Foods too. So we're not the only ones who are struggling with this dynamic. Over time, our gross margins have also been under a lot more pressure than they have been. We used to not have to think about it. We used to be able to charge sort of what we thought we could get for things and we'd, we'd set it and forget it and we'd never worry about it again. But there's a lot more price pressure. Again, our customers are exposed to more prices as they go to more places. And so they're seeing that actually we're on the kind of expensive side. And why is that? Why is a co-op doing that? Uh, so there's downward pressure on margins. And there's also constant upward pressure on personnel costs. But this has been especially true in the last couple of years. Um, as those of us who are working grocery stores know the cost of benefits is always going up. Premiums for insurance always go up. But in the last couple of years, there's also been an incredible upward push on wages. That fight for 15 movement is a national movement. And it's actually impacting a lot of co-ops because we're finding that co-ops have not necessarily kept up with the cost of living wages relative to the rising cost of rents. Uh, the cost of rents in the last five years has greatly outpaced wages nationally. And even with the announcement that for the first time in many, many years, household incomes have actually increased, the average wage at co-ops is still not keeping up with the cost of rent. And we're finding that a lot of co-ops are behind on that. So there's, all, there's upward pressure on wages in, in addition to benefits. And if you have downward pressure on margins and upward pressure on benefits and wages, then the money that we get to take home and do cool stuff with is also declining and diminishing. EBITDA is a uh, industry term. It stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. But it's really just the cool money that we have left at the end of the day to cool, do things with. It's the, the fuel for the co-op fire. Um, whether it's investing more in local growers, whether it's giving bonuses and gain share, or whether it's reinvesting in our businesses and buying that new cooler, we have less money to do that with. And a couple more points for comparison. The difference between 2012 and 2015, that one percentage point difference, is $20 million that's not there to reinvest in our businesses. Another point of comparison, Whole Foods, even with a sort of negative same store sales growth, still earns about 10% EBITDA with which they can reinvest in their businesses. So uh, this does have an impact on us and our ability to compete in the marketplace. Beyond increased competition, those of you who work in grocery stores, and I recognize many of you from the retail uh, environment, know that it's just getting harder, right? Uh, it's getting more complex. Whether we're talking about Fair Labor Standards Act, Food Safety Modernization Act, PCI compliance, running a grocery store is no longer bringing in product in the back and selling it out the front. It's much more complicated than that and requires much more of the staff to be able to manage it. We're dealing with price deflation. Uh, there's a lot more increased pressure and varied pressure from various stakeholder groups. Um, there's a talent gap that's out there that the jobs require more skill than they've had in the past. And we're competing for good skilled people, friendly service oriented people as well as for sales and customers. 
all of this puts a lot more pressure on the system. And I know that you feel it. Those of you who are on boards of directors, those of you who work in co-ops, I know that you're feeling more pressure today than we felt in years past. And that manifests itself sometimes publicly. These are all real headlines. These are not all the results of a new competitor coming to market, but they are all the result of one of two dynamics. Either the co-op is trying to change and a stakeholder group is resisting it, or the co-op is unwilling to change and a stakeholder group is pushing them towards change. In both situations, they can result in very public displays of conflict, um, which in co-op world tends to make us even more uncomfortable, I think, than outside of the co-op world. But this pressure is coming to bear on all of us. Again, staff, boards, and I would argue that nobody more today than our general managers. General manager turnover has increased so dramatically over the last few years that we are not ready to keep up with it. Um, we knew that there was going to be turnover. There's a lot of uh, old, talented people in the system who uh, are beginning to retire. Many of them are leaving early. Many of them are being forced out. There's a lot of new people coming into the job and finding that it's way more difficult than they ever expected, and they're leaving as soon as they get hired. Um, and it turns out that good general managers for food co-ops do not grow on trees. <laughs> that the skill set required is so much more than a general manager of a comparable business, because there's so many more stakeholder groups to manage because the nuance and delicacy with which we manage those stakeholder groups, that demand is so much greater. And people are really struggling coming into these roles to, uh, to do it. And, and also, co-ops haven't necessarily been the best at GM compensation either. So there's that aspect plaguing us as well. But all you have to do is look at the classified page on Cooperative Grocer Magazine to see just how many high-level key positions are currently being sought. And keep in mind that not every co-op even posts on co-op grocer to get their GMs. So there's a lot of GM turnover and pressure, which is especially painful today, because today we have this real need for leadership. The market is changing. Our co-ops are being forced to consider if and how we're going to change relative to the market. And those changes require a special kind of leadership, which we call courageous leadership. Um, to be able to get our co-ops through and over the hurdles. Um, very simply, courageous leadership is the willingness of a co-op leader to take action despite or in spite of known opposition or resistance. It is not done in a vacuum. Cooper uh, courageous leadership relies on input from key stakeholders who are most fluent in the contexts in which the co-op operates. And there's an additional burden in co-op land where we have to go out of our way to ensure that we are doing everything we can when we're ushering changes forward to try and get as much buy-in and support as possible in that process. Um, there is a real need for us to try and tell our story, communicate the vision, not just why the change needs to happen, but what the world is going to look like after the change is made, to get people, as many people, to buy into that as possible. And there are lots of different tools that co-op leaders can use to do that. A lot of co-ops like the Zing Train Bottom Line Change Management Tool. A lot of co-ops follow Rose Beth's Moth's Cantor's uh, change platform. Um, regardless, it's, a, it's an extra step that, that, quite frankly, analogous businesses don't necessarily need to spend as much time with that we really do. Now, more complexity to this. That said, despite the work that we must do to get people to come with us, we don't have the luxury to wait for consensus. And it's not going to happen anyway. We are not going to get everybody to come with us. And uh, we're not rewarded for inaction. In fact, the longer we wait to make difficult changes, oftentimes the harder the changes are to make. So we need to take action. There's no perfect time. There's no silver bullet solution. There's no sure fit right answer to any situation. And we have to take, have the courage to push forward even without complete agreement that that's the right direction to go. And this is complicated, difficult stuff. I mean, people go to school for years for this kind of stuff, right? Um, and that's what we're asking of our general managers to be able to do. Why is it needed today? Well, quite simply, it's needed today because our co-ops need to change. And that, how they need to change will vary from co-op to co-op. 
but we cannot stand still in a changing marketplace and expect to continue to be relevant. Most of our co-ops will need to find ways to change. And there is no magical solution to this. The change is only going to happen because we usher it forward. There is no volume ferry that's going to solve our problems. And again, we're not rewarded for inaction. We cannot wait indefinitely. So we need courageous leadership because we only have a limited window of time to make changes before change becomes an insurmountable challenge. We need to usher our organizations through, and that's why we're talking about courageous leadership today. I'm going to talk about three ways in which NCG has identified that we need to see some courageous leadership in the system, and it comes from our co-ops telling us these are the areas that are most challenging from them. This is not necessarily just us declaring it. We're getting this information from our co-ops saying these are the areas that are hardest to, uh, to affect change. And the first one is in productivity. And productivity can tend to conjure images of a heartless corporation squeezing the little guy or sending jobs overseas to gain an extra buck. But in reality, productivity is very much in line with cooperative values. Because productivity is how co-ops, most of whom have a, a real commitment to wanting to be able to offer livable wages, Productivity is how we are going to be able to do that with limited margins and in a low growth environment. In fact, it's the only way to do it. And we've, it's, it's going to require a certain amount of courageous leadership because it's a culture change. As co-ops, we have never, ever had to emphasize or put value on productivity or efficiencies. The growth just came. We never had to fight for it. We never had to exist in a place where there wasn't growth constantly bringing more money into our organizations. So now we have to change a lot of our assumptions. We have to do things that we've never had to do before, like measure our productivity, measure what it is that we do, hold people accountable for results, and hopefully reward them for achieving results as well. If we can get past that, if we can break through some of those barriers uh, with, our, with our staff, uh, we can continue to offer strong livable wages regardless of what your sales look like. But we have to be productive in, in response to that. Another area in which there is a demand for, for a lot of courageous leadership right now is in pricing. And we know why we need to do this. It's because our consumers tell us, hey, why are, your, why are you selling strawberries for $10.99 a pound? And yet, this is another area where as co-ops, we've never really had to adjust or pay attention. And the courageous leadership is necessary here, not because our members are going to be resistant to us. In fact, our members are telling us that we're actually not doing a very good job of meeting their needs. We have to exhibit courageous leadership here because this is new for our staff. That to be truly price competitive, we have to be a lot more aware of what the competition is doing. We have to be a lot more flexible and adaptable to changing our prices as circumstances change. We have to be able to manage much more complex variable margin programs. We have to take a lot more risk with deep promotions and be willing to make mistakes and try it again. And, and we have to change our focus at the retail level from trying to preserve margin percent to growing margin dollars. And that's all complicated. Again, people go to business school to master things like that. And we're asking our staff to be able to step forward in doing that. And we don't always have the skill sets we need. And we, as leaders, don't always know what to do to tell them how to do it. So it does require a little bit of courageous leadership to, to give people the flexibility to fail in trying to do this and recover and try again. And to, to demand that we, this is something we need to pay attention to. This is something we really do need to focus on if we're going to be a viable alternative. Now, we are never, ever going to out Kroger Kroger. We are never going to out Walmart Walmart, and that's not what we're suggesting here. But we do need to get good enough at this so that we can be a plausible alternative to the average consumer. And that's going to require some leadership. The good news is if we do that, it actually helps us with, for what a lot of us is, another goal or end. Most of our co-ops have multiple ends. Most of our co-ops have an end to be able to sell more high quality values based products, sell more organic products, sell more local products, more sustainable products, more fair trade products. Most of our co-ops have a mission to do that and that's also very important. 
Um, but a lot of our co-ops also have a mission to try and make ourselves more accessible to more of our communities. And I think that many of our co-ops are finding that we tend to do a better job of meeting the product purity requirement than we do of meeting the accessibility product, uh, requirement. And I'm here to tell you today that it doesn't need to be a mutually exclusive decision, that we think co-ops can and should do both. And we're going to do that by offering choice. And that brings us to the third area in which we need to see some traction, which is by offering more accessible product offerings. And I want to go on the record here and say clearly and concretely, because this gets misconstrued often, we are not saying that all co-ops should carry conventional products. Okay? We're not saying that. What we are saying is that we haven't checked relative to our markets in a long time what our product assortment should be and what the needs of our communities are. We are asking people to always offer multiple price point choices where those price points are set are going to be dependent on you and your co-op and what your values are. For one co-op, it might be offering conventional products. For another co-op, it might be the field day co-op basics organic product that's in their store as the entry level product. The concept though is that we offer an entry level product that's decent quality, but the, the reason you buy it is a price. Is that a fair price? And then you offer a slightly higher quality product for a slightly more expensive price, and then you offer a premium product and you charge a premium price for it. And that by giving people the choice, we get the ability to steer them. If we can offer choices, and if we've got great system and great customer service, we can tell people why the premium product is a worthwhile choice and steer them in that direction. One of my colleagues in, um, who ran a, a hybrid co-op, conventional and organic mixed co-op in um, Wisconsin said, our goal is, is not to be food fundamentalists, our goal is to be food evangelists. The distinction is that fundamentalism restricts choices in order to protect core beliefs. Whereas evangelism uses choices to highlight the value of the belief that you want to focus on. And that was their mission. So whether you offer conventional or not, whether you offer anything or not, by offering choices and having good product level messaging, good customer service, we can actually influence our shoppers to make different kinds of choices while still allowing them to get their basic needs met on a case by case basis. And that choice is very, very valuable to our customers. And this is not all these suggestions, these three things I'm talking about, we're not doing this to grow for growth's sake. We pick these three things to focus on because co-ops tell us these are common barriers to their ability to grow. And that by addressing them and minimizing them, we can actually serve more of our communities, invite more of our people to come into our stores and share the great co-op experience that we all value and, and invite them to take their wellness journeys with us as opposed to competitors. And in so doing that, we can grow our impact, which is really the cool thing about co-ops, the impact that we have on our communities, the impact we have on our staff, our quality jobs, the, our influence on the industry, our ability to impact all of that is dependent on our ability to continue to grow. And our ability to continue to grow in this new market is gonna require that all of us, and it's gonna vary from co-op to co-op, figures out how we need to change and adapt to the new market realities. And there's going to be resistance. Change is hard for all of us. Nobody likes change that I know of. But some of us view change as a necessary part of existence, that we're here to change and evolve, and it's hard sometimes, but that's what life brings. And some of us view change as something that re resembles loss, that we're losing something that matters most to us. And they're, they're fearful of that change, and they're resistant to that change. And if we're fearful and resistant to something in a genuine democratic organization like our co-ops, you will get factions that rise up to resist a direction. And the Take Back the Co-op movement in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico is an example of this. So the, for those of you who don't know, Take Back the Co-op is a group of members that rose up in opposition to the co-op deciding that they could better serve their communities by expanding their conventional produce. To be fair, this co-op always carried conventional products. But they made a strategic decision at the board level that they wanted to serve more of their communities and have more price points, so they made the decision at their co-op that they did want to expand their, co their conventional offerings. And the membership, especially at their Santa Fe store, saw this as a betrayal of the values that they held onto most clearly. And I actually can sympathize with that thought. 
I can sympathize with the thought that people fear losing something that's meaningful to them and that's important to them. These groups, when they happen, and you will experience resistance groups at all of your co-ops regardless of what's going on, resistance groups are passionate, committed individuals that are trying to hold on to the thing about the co-op that they value most and trying to stop the co-op, in this case, from changing and adapting to the market that's changing around them. They also tend to be acutely aware of our uncomfort around conflict and disagreement and will be very vocal and leverage that in their, in their tactics. And they will oftentimes, their passion will trump their willingness to hear other perspectives or to see middle ground in what's actually a fairly complicated concept and to try and meet halfway. At the end of the day, they're entitled to their opinion, and we are democracies. But when it comes to whether co-ops should change to adapt to the new normal, we think that they're wrong. Now, the Take Back the Co-op movement uh, has seen this presentation in other formats, and they actually misattributed this quote to me, and I'm, I'm very flattered. Uh, but in reality, this is a quote from Rosalind Carter, former First Lady. And the irony is that this quote was offered in the spirit of progressive politics in a very conservative era. She was trying, when she's talking about getting people to go where they're not necessarily willing to go, she's talking about leading people towards a more progressive politics, to a more progressive society. And in this instance, the folks that are resisting the change at their co-op are actually a conservative element within the co-op that's resisting the effort to change and adapt to the times. But I'm here to tell you that change and adaptation is in front of us whether we want to see it or not. And, and how long we resist or not. And it's our job as co-op leaders to listen and be respectful. But it's also our job as leaders to represent the needs and values of the majority of our membership, not just the vocal few. And that is going to lead to conflict. And if I would end on anything today, it's to say that part of courageous leadership is actually embracing that. We are operating democratic organizations. And democ democracies are messy. And they're not always, very rarely actually, is there agreement on everything? And we're going to argue. And conflict is an inherent part of this, and it should be embraced. Conflict and disagreement are important parts of our organizations. But we still have an obligation to push forward. After we listen and after we decide that the changes, whatever change that you at your co-ops feel you need to make to adjust to the new market realities, whether it's keeping pure to your, your, your product selection or going conventional, whether it's going really low on prices and learning how to live at lower margins or staying where you are. It doesn't really matter. Once you decide what's necessary to preserve your co-op's uh, uh, ability to have impact for the long haul, for years to come, for future members, once you do that, be willing to have the argument. Be willing to have the discussion. Be willing to advocate for your position. Don't let that, don't let Things like this bully us into changing course, necessarily. Um, courageous leadership oftentimes takes courage in saying to people that we love and respect, hey, we're going to disagree on this and we're still going to move forward. Would encourage you all to be willing to embrace that and to help usher your co-ops forward however you see that needs to happen. I'm going to just end by, by thanking you. I want to thank you for being here. I want to be, thank you for being willing to listen and have conversations around this. And I want to thank you for the conversations you're going to have for the rest of the day and back at your co-ops. Because it's really true that the decisions that we make here at this time, at this time and place, when this new normal is happening to our co-ops, it is going to impact the future generations and the futures of our co-ops. Thank you for having the courage to have those kind of conversations.